watches the Watchmen? Better yet, who takes the Watchmen to the great beyond? While there's many deities, universes, and eternal paradises in the World of Warcraft universe, one of the figures that players are learning more and more about is the troll Loa and keeper of the afterlife, Juan Samdi. Loa of the Graves, the troll version of the Muppets Waldorf and Statler during the Battle for Azeroth expansion, and the ghost with the most connections to this downhill sprint to the afterlife that has been seemingly set up ever since players downed Arthas at the end of Wrath of the Lich King. He's also part of Blizzard's attempt to finally diversify the troll race and answer the decades-long call from fans to make trolls more than just the baby-eating, culturally appropriative voodoo junkie persona that they've seemingly never been allowed to overcome. Bwansamdi is also an interesting moral quandary in the form of a chaotic neutral entity, none too happy that he's been played for a fool by Sylvanas Windrunner, former Horde warchief and seemingly the next major lore character to be placed upon the raid boss chopping block. Where do you go when you die? And more importantly, who is the one showing you the way? I'm columnist Will Harrison, and today on Essence of Azeroth, we'll be diving deep into the other side of life, taking a look at Troll Loa Bonsamdi, his origins, narrative function in the Warcraft lore, and if the Trolls revamp was actually as successful as it intended to be. Let's figure out together what we're asking of old Bonsamdi. Dreaming of a better sleep? Tossing and turning is not your destiny. And Ollie is here to help. Ollie invites you to sink into sweet, sweet slumber to improve your mental and physical health and overall wellness. More than just melatonin, Ollie's ingredients help you unwind your mind for a delightfully dreamy drift off. Sleep is on the way at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. Tales of the Loa. Buansamdi guards our spirits well. He makes death most inviting. You think he be a trickster, his humor often biting. Behind his smile and pointed humor, there lies a darkness, a hint of rumor. He knows things that make the brave men shriek. The truth from him, you must not seek. The realm of death be his alone, your life and spirit to him be known. And when that life do end, make sure Bwansamdi be your friend. Then Bwansamdi will surely guide, come on through to the other side. Death is a tricky thing in MMOs, both as a mechanic and taking into account the diegesis of the world. That is, what is considered real within the fictional walls of a story or world. When a player dies in World of Warcraft, they see a ghostly veil over the world of adventure that they were just in moments ago, killing pigs and collecting crappy gear without a care in the world. It's a mechanic meant to bring about the idea that players need to take death seriously in the digital world, lest they suffer a penalty and the mundane chore of running back to their fleshy prison. But what does that character see? Does my Blood Elf Priest see the same grayed-out world of purgatory? A vortex of wind and black replacing the once vibrant skybox? Why doesn't this death scene that we tend to take for granted change based on the race, class, or alignment of the character? In a world where we diegetically know 
is full of multiverses, deities, gods of both lowercase and uppercase G, and literally manifestations of all those powers in the form of supernatural abilities, why does it seem that everyone kinda just goes to the same crappy place when they're close to shuffling off that mortal coil? Well, that's the question, isn't it? And one we're learning more and more about as World of Warcraft says goodbye to the mortal plane of existence and heads to the land of the dead. Or at least one of them. The Shadowlands. It's an idea that the folks at Blizzard have thought about exploring for almost as long as the game's existence. It ranks right up there with how Kul Tiras and Zandalar were originally planned as the first true WoW expansion, but was changed because they literally lacked the server space to add any new zones to Azeroth as it existed. The team, therefore, went out to Outlands as it was able to be stored somewhere else and wouldn't interfere with what little space the team had to work with. The devs also kicked around an afterlife expansion idea that players could only reach by getting their character killed, kicking off a phantasmical journey into what happens when the rats, pigs, and elite guards of the opposing faction's capital city finally get the best of you. This may have been too heady an idea so early in the game's life, but after 15 years of players having killed seemingly every major lore character in Warcraft's history, it appears time to go to the great beyond. Death, life, and whatever is in between is messy and complicated in the world of Warcraft. Is death final? Who actually controls the power of unlife? Was Arthas and Ner'zhul just one or two pawns in a larger death game? Is the afterlife just another bad land of suffering disguised as eternal paradise, as Sylvanas Windrunner seems to think it is? Those are all questions to be asked once we're knee-deep in Shadowlands lore, but for now we have some hints, guesses, and retcons that give us some lore-based answers. Many of those answers come from the trolls Loa of Graves, Juan Zombie. Sadly, if you're an Alliance stand, then there just isn't much to be known. Uh, you really haven't seen a lot of the story. But one thing is for sure, Bonsomdi will be taking a role in Shadowlands, both as setup man and the star of at least one dungeon. So, if you're a lifelong Alliance player that knows not of how the trolls roll, then let's start there and give a quick at a glance of the troll race, the literal original Azeroth humanoid species and once a predominant empire on three sundering Kalimdor. So, I am going to keep this troll summary short, as I am here to make you think about death and get sad and stuff, not get bogged down in 20,000 years of troll history lessons. If you want more details, I highly recommend the novels World of Warcraft Chronicles 1-3, through 3, released in 2016 and meant as a half-retcon, half-retelling of the lore before and during World of Warcraft. This is actually the earliest mention of things like the Shadowlands and the Astral Alignment chart that showcases the powers of the cosmos, and pertinent to our discussion, how the Troll Empire came to be, then came not to be. And now, a short history of the Troll Civilization. <sighs> So, before the Sundering, Kalimdor being ripped apart because Sargeras tried to do a Kool-Aid man onto Azeroth, and Illidan pulled an R. Kelly, in that he could believe he could fly, not that he was an evil jerk defended by normal people because of nostalgia, there were the trolls. The earliest of the non-Titan species, trolls came about because some squirrels and birds and things were mutated by the mystical energies of the Well of Eternity, font of mystical power created after an old god was plucked off Azeroth like a tick, and left a weeping well of power from the sleeping Titan inside the planet. Got it? And in case you didn't know, all of the elf races are an offshoot of the trolls. A majority of trolls during this period were more interested in conquest and expansion across the giant landmass Pangaea known as Kalimdor. 
but one tribe of dark tinted trolls were super into the moon and found the Well of Eternity and thought, hey, this is a great vacation spot. Presto changeo, evolution kicks in down the line and you get the Night Elves. Meanwhile, the other mainline troll tribes had taken root in Zuldazar, on top of that fun, fun mountain that Horde players have gotten to know really well in Battle for Azeroth. And while those aforementioned dark trolls had taken up worship in the moon, the rest of troll society surrendered around the worship of the Wild Gods, later called Loa by troll culture. If you're familiar with that astral chart going around that appears in World of Warcraft Chronicle Volume 1, which you can find literally by googling World of Warcraft Astral Alignment Chart, it shows the alignments of the various forces in the WoW universe. There's six alignments, all working in harmony and against one another at all times. The Wild Gods are part of the life alignment spawning forth from nature. Now, where druidism that came from the Night Elves would later work in harmony with the Wild Gods and commune with those spirits, the trolls took a slightly different route. They saw these titanic creatures and worshipped them in a very exchange-based way. Think of the Greek gods, but with bears and frogs and stuff, all demanding temples and gifts from their followers, which provided the Loa with spiritual energy, which in turn gave their followers power. Some of these exchanges of power are for the good of the land, such as the wild god Torkali, who you might remember as the Triceratops, who eventually gives you a mount um, in Zoldazar, who looks over the land, travelers, and protects the more migratory species. However, there are some Loa worshipper relationships that are much more about equivalent exchange and favor for a favor such as Bonsamdi, Zandalari Loa of Graves, who is first introduced to players in Wrath of the Lich King as part of the Trolls' rebooted starting area, the Echo Isles. Bonsamdi is implored by Vol'jin, leader of the Darkspear tribe, to help the Shadow Hunter and eventual Warchief, and then eventual not Warchief, to take back his birthplace from the zombie voodoo troll priest Zalazane, which is interesting because before Vol'jin ever mentions Zalazane, Bonsamdi has no interest in helping. He tells Vol'jin that his Darkspear tribe of trolls stopped providing worship, which all happened because the Darkspear were ran off the island by Zalazane. Who be starting up me bones? Dim's won Zombie's charges, and not to be touched! Hmm. I know who you are, Shadow Hunter, and I know what you want. But what makes you think I'm gonna help you? Ain't a wise thing calling me from the other side. Dark Spear. It's been long time since I heard the drums. Since I drank the ritual offerings. I be watching over your dead, Vol'jin, and for nothing. Why have the Dark Spear forsaken one Zamdi? Huh? Zalazin. Mm. Time to see how bad you want this, Shadow Hunter. Time to see if you be worthy. You think you got what it takes to face me? Give up, Shadow Hunter. Enough. <laughs> you got some big mojo, Vol'jin. Maybe you're worth helping after all. Go to the old village across the water. Take it back. I'll help you then. Hey there! Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details.
Also, you're not hearing things. That is a different voice actor. For Buonsomni in Wrath of Lich King, he would be recast in Battle for Azeroth. However, as he is wont to do, Buonsomni cuts a deal with Vol'jin. This begins a long connection between Loa and Troll that stretches even beyond Vol'jin's death and now undeath. After all, you make a deal with a devil, and eventually you have to pay. But is Buonsomni a devil? Or THE devil? And more importantly, in a society where trolls found power and oneness with the wild gods, how is there a Loa that not only takes on the appearance of a troll, but has the powers on the complete opposite side of the astral alignment chart? Some of the specifics of this will most likely not be revealed until Shadowlands is in full swing, but we do know a bit about Bonsomni and how he functions based off inspirations for the character, as well as the Warcraft novels and a little bit of revealed information, both data mined and that has been added into the game uh, with the most recent pre-patch. The first question to answer is that all things have equal and opposite reactions. So it makes perfect sense that if the trolls found power in the life energy of the universe, then they'd eventually also find power in its exact opposite, in unlife, decay, necromancy, the other side. Or in the case of the trolls, call it what it is, voodoo. At this point, it's important to stop and talk about the portrayal of the trolls, all the non-human species in WoW, and all of high fantasy fiction, as it's impossible to talk about the inspirations for the traits that players have now come to associate with the likes of the troll race without bringing up their misguided race connections made between real-life races and fantasy races. And it's undeniable even not taking into account the patois-laced dialogue of the trolls, who had early dialogue that was almost always feeling like it was limited to telling players to beware the voodoo, and that they were cannibals, and over and over again. If you played through Stranglethorn Vale, you know what I'm talking about. It's all of that for 10 hours. Or the fact that the best a person of color could do for the longest time when making a human character was to make a white person that looked like they had been colored with a brown crayon. It's not great. It wasn't until the most recent pre-patch that customization options finally improved enough that it wasn't a total embarrassment. But there's always more work to be done in regards to representation, and all of high fantasy, including World of Warcraft, still has miles to go. Buonsamdi himself is an obvious example of where the writer's inspiration was pulled from, as the Loa is a direct offshoot of Haitian voodoo folklore character Baron Samedi, a chaotic neutral figure with a skull facade face who is more dealmaker and trickster than evil force. However, Buonsamdi is proof positive that Blizzard has been making a somewhat good faith attempt at trying to expand upon who the trolls are as a people and not just leave them as baby-eating cannibals that they have been for years in World of Warcraft, or to not ignore the fact that they've just been fodder characters for expansion after expansion. So shallow was the trolls' development that at one point they didn't even have their own starting area. They were just lumped in with the orcs while the Echo Isles were just a tiny questing area full of crabs that was very much skippable, especially thanks to all the water you had to swim. Uh, I don't ever want to go back there again. Thanks, World of Warcraft Classic. Past that, players wouldn't run into another troll until Stranglethorn and the Gorobashi tribe. A uh, tribe of trolls that became one of the main powerhouses of troll civilization until they also became splintered from a debate about whether they should worship the gods and nature or this bony evil weirdo named Hakar that just wanted to eat everyone's souls. So, if you didn't play a troll, all you really got as far as development were bloodthirsty cannibals, voodoo priests, and not much else. It's not very enlightening when the inspiration for so many of the non-human races in WoW were clearly meant as stand-ins for people of color. Not until Wrath of the Lich King where Blizzard really tried to counteract the narrative of trolls just being flesh-eating one-liners, and not their true place in the lore, as the original starting point for half of Azeroth's mortal races and just as interesting as the Night Elves. 
even then, there's still a lot of horrid backstabbery and poor writing up until Battle of Azeroth that leaves the trolls, and all of the races of the, of the Horde for that matter, looking like a collection of murderers all waiting to turn on one another. It isn't until most recent patch updates that the Horde has went back to being portrayed as outsiders coming together in unity and consistency and acceptance, which is far more appealing than waiting for their next defense against the dark arts teacher, uh, I mean war chief, to turn heel and become a raid boss. So yes, Bonsamdi is based on Haitian folklore, which is also an explanation as to why there appears to be multiple Loas of Death. Part of this could be retcons getting in the way, but before Buan Samdi, there was also Psemedi, a lo loa of the grave found in Nagrand during b the Burning Crusade as part of a quest to send the dead to the afterlife. It would be easy to hand wave this as, oh, Psemedi became Buan Samdi, and it's just another classic Blizzard retcon, ha ha ha, but there's multiple loas of death, and potentially more than just one afterlife, as example by the Shadowlands. For a few minutes here, we're going to be getting into some spoiler territory for Shadowlands, but nothing about the main plot or anything that hasn't been floating out there. After all, it's hard to ignore the siren song of beta leaks, and if you ever go to wowhead.com, it's almost improbable to not get spoiled. However, the spoils in this case allude to what the Loa of Death hierarchy may be, and where Bonsambi falls into line, not anything specific about story, so please don't be afraid. The first thing to say is that there appears to be death loas for each tribe, which makes sense as we're talking about a tangible world where deities are real and worshippers derive actual power from them. Diegesis. And much like the physical world, it appears the loas of death all fall into different allegiances and functions. While Bonsamdi appears to be the most neutral, and given the help he provides Queen Talanji in the novel Shadow Rising, which is the most recent World of Warcraft novel, he clearly has a soft spot for the trolls. This isn't the case with all Death Loa, such as Mazala, better known as the Loa of Graves for the Sand Fury tribe based out of Zulfarak in Tanneris of Southern Kalimdor. As Bonsamdi says to, to Talanji in the novel Shadow Rising, and no, I will not be saying this in a patois, reckless child of a reckless king, consider yourself lucky you are working with me and not another Loa. Mazala would eat you alive. Too many cooks? Maybe. But Blizzard has been trying to parse out the lore and make it all a little bit more functional. 2016 was a big year for Blizzard, beginning to retcon its overarching universe of Warcraft, as to set up future expansions. This was when World of Warcraft Chronicles came out, which is essentially the in-canon history of the events before and during WoW. This is also our first mention of the Shadowlands as an actual place, and it's also the first appearance of that astral chart that I mentioned earlier. At the same time, it's where novels such as Illidan, uh, which covered exactly what the Betrayer was up to during the Burning Crusade, literally minute by minute. It's actually kind of fascinating, uh, as well as providing a background for the Demon Hunter class, which frankly should have been in their starting area. But hey, they probably ran out of time. Uh, another one of these books is the YA series called Traveler, which was actually written by the same writer as Shadows Rising, so there are some connections. And it's about the Pirate King... Um, the son of a pirate king, setting off on an adventure to find his father. These books give us our first connection to Mazala, to the typically fell-aligned Nethrazaim, better known as the Dreadlords, and potentially the entities behind the entire alignment chart being messed with from behind the scenes since the beginning of Warcraft's universe. Um, in Traveler, this former Sand Fury Loa of Death has thrown in with the Hidden. That's the group of Nethrism that have been trying to move chess pieces behind the scenes across the entire chart. Whether we're talking about the Burning Crusade, the Naru, the Void Lords, they seem to have their hands in a lot of pies. And it's part of an overarching part to come to Shadowlands and upend the Cosmic Order of Death. Bonsamdi mentions in Shadows Rising that it's taking all of his spiritual power to save the trolls who have died from going into the Maw, which is the Shadowlands equivalent of the deepest circle of hell. 
Bonsamdi reveals in the novel that all souls are heading into the mall now, not just the worst of the worst as it's supposed to be. As, for example, Arthas, who we get seen thrown into the mall by a newly empowered Uther the Lightbringer in one of those World of Warcraft Afterlives uh, shorts that have appeared recently, which are very good. Go watch those. So, Bonsamdi has been straining his otherworldly powers to redirect trolls to, once again, no patois here, the other side. Um, it's his very own pocket dimension in the afterlife. This might also be why Sylvanas Windrunner is attempting to permanently kill Bonsamdi in Shadows Rising, as part of her continuing efforts to gain as much ghostly power as possible while also redirecting the dead into the Maul. If you're thinking that Buonsomni sounds awfully heroic for a supposedly chaotic neutral entity, it's important to keep in mind that Buonsomni always serves his best interests. Whether it was getting the now-dead Zandalari king Rastakhan to sign away his family's blood lineage in a pact that is now cursed Talanji, something that she has to come to terms with in Shadows Rising, or helping the player character get to the bottom of why Vol'jin is still hanging around the post-afterlife, going as far as to pointing the player to Stormheim and even the Frozen Throne. Ah, you come back. Did you find the spirit of Vol'jin? Oh, you're here to make a deal. Loa of death, your servant Vol'jin has called to you, yet you have turned a deaf ear to his pleas. What? No, 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 no. You be mistaken, Delanji. <sighs> Speak plainly. Was it you who urged Vol'jin to name Sylvanas war chief? Mind your tone, Bullman. Or you'll be talking with your father soon enough. Cho, why would me want the Banshee Queen in charge? No, no, no. Sure, I'm an alpha war on death, but not Sylvanas. She be tipping the skills too far. Balance be important. Besides, that one got a nasty habit of keeping what she kills. No, your war chief be no friend to old Buan Samdi. Your words are trouble we do. Step forward, speaker of the horde. Maybe there be a way to find the answers you see. Whether we're talking about the Valkyr, Mazala, or the Lich King himself, there are layers upon layers when it comes to death in the WoW canon. It's not as simple as, Bonsamdi is a low of death. Clearly there are multiple Arbiters of the Dead, for each cosmic alignment, and all with different agendas. And without providing spoilers, we do know that one of the dungeons in Shadowlands is the other side, Bonsamdi's pocket dimension that we mentioned earlier. And players will help Bonsamdi attempt to take back his realm from Mazala, clearly empowered by his pact with the Dreadlords and potentially even Sylvanas Windrunner. If you type in, and I'll spell it out, D-E space O-T-H-E-R space S-I-D-E, the other side, into the dungeon adventure guide in-game, the listing for this and all the other Shadowlands dungeons and raids are all listed, including the lore and boss lists. The final encounter will see players helping Wansomdi get free of Mazala's grasp, as the former Sand Fury Loa attempts to swallow Wansomdi's pocket dimension whole, souls and all. Once more, Wansomdi seemingly sympathetic to the plight of his followers. That's not very Loa of him especially considering that Mazala considers Bonsamdi to be too soft-hearted and not willing to demand worship, one of the many reasons the Elder Loa goes after the other side in the first place. And that's what makes Bonsamdi so interesting as a lore figure, but also as a character that the player gets to interact with throughout the course of Battle for Azeroth, at least if you're on the Horde side. I was genuinely surprised upon my first death in BFA and finding that the spirit healer was this Death Note looking spooky man who reminded me of Bushmaster from season 2 of Marvel's Luke Cage. 
Bonsamdi is a through line for Horde players throughout most of BFA, similarly to how the Lich King was a common thread for players in Wrath of the Lich King, constantly appearing in each zone and tying all the various stories together. Uh, one of the more interesting things is how you can follow him directly from Nazmir into the battle for Dazal Allure Raid, in which case, if, no matter if you're Horde or Alliance, you see him on both sides. However, he's not just a black hat baddie or even comedic relief. There's some engaging pathos with Bonsamdi, both in-game and in the extended universe of novels, that shows he's clearly freaked out by whatever is coming over the Shadowlands horizon. If you're Alliance through and through, then a lot of this is going to be foreign. Luckily, with the new changes to leveling, it's never been easier to experience all of WoW's content, and faster. I highly recommend you roll a troll and experience Bonsamdi's through line for yourself. I managed to level a paladin character from 30 to 50 in less than 10 hours, and that's pretty fast, at least compared to how it used to be, so try it for yourself. And, and it's funny, because at the start of BFA development, Blizzard didn't really have any plans for Bonsomni until they realized how popular the character had become after the first patch in that weird in-between where post-game content is kind of rolling in. In, in a world of self-serious, Games of Throne esque high fantasy, Bonsomni is a breath of fresh air, especially because of the fact that he's a serious threat at times. After all, he is the one that empowers Rastakhan in the battle for Dazal Allure Raid, and as we now know from the Shadows Rising novel, Talanji's and his fates are directly tied together, and if one goes, so does the other. It seems pretty obvious that Shadowlands is not only player's first real dip into the pool of the cosmos, but is also going to look to answer some big questions about the game's lore. The layout of the Shadowlands lore shows that each of the six cosmic powers essentially has its own quadrant of this afterlife area, or something like it, and that Sylvanas is looking to tear it all apart. The only questions remaining is what entity is behind her motivations. Is it the Void Lords? Uh, who knows? I mean, at this point, the Void Lords are the only ones that haven't been touched on. All the old gods are dead. Sargeras is somewhere with Illidan out in space. It's all wide open. There's also the question of who created the Pantheon, that is, the team of cosmic space gods that Sargeras at one point was uh, teaming up with. And what exactly kicked off the creation of the Dark Great Beyond and the Twisting Nether? Now, I realize I've posited a lot of questions for a first episode of the podcast. Um, and if all of this sounds more like a primer for Shadowlands, then you're absolutely right. We do know that Bonsamdi has a stake in helping to maintain the order of the cosmic food chain, and that Sylvanas attempting to topple everything puts Bonsamdi's power at great risk. Bonsamdi also stands as a potential risk to the Banshee Queen's plans, enough so that she would risk an entire operation to eliminate the Loa, and that Nathanos Blightcaller's failure to do so in the Shadows Rising novel. And that Nathanos Blightcaller's failure to do so was a shame great enough that it leads to Nathanos being sent to his room to wait until Mommy calls him for supper, retreating back to Eastern Plaguelands and the Maris Stead. This all goes to show that Bonsamdi may be out for himself, but he does have honor and a soft spot for trolls and even the other races, as the other side actually holds more than just trolls. He was trying to save as many horde lives as he could uh, from being sent to the mall, which at this point we might as well just assume is a fate worse than death. He even attempts to let Talanji out of her father's pact at the end of Shadows Rising, with Talanji realizing that her reign will go better if she works in tandem with Aloha, and not in some kind of strange equivalent exchange that she was forced into. As a thank you, Bonsamdi allows her to briefly reunite with her father. See, he's a nice guy if you get past the bones and death and stuff. Right? There's no proof yet, but my running theory is that Bonsamdi was, at one point, an early troll priest, or something of that sort, who was transformed into what he is now by the other Loas of Death. It makes sense given that Undeath has to have something dead first in order to empower it. There's in-game proof of this, with a piece of lore found on the Isle of Thunder in Mists of Pandaria. It's an item called the Shadows of the Loa, which is readable, and says, 
The Zandalari lo worship Loa, powerful spirits who have been a part of the world predating even the Titans. Countless Loa exist, most weak, but some very powerful. Most are shapeless, whereas others have animal or creature forms. Zandalari families often worship their own family Loas. Cities usually have their own civic deities, and the greatest Loa are worshipped by the nation as a whole. Powerful, enlightened Zandalari can become Loas upon their death, or so it is believed. These spirits are central to the Zandalari worldview. So say the Loa, so go the Zandalari. However, that opens up a whole other can of worms. Did Bonsamdi predate the splintering of the tribes? Who gave him his power? And if so, and so forth, what does it mean if something predates the Titans? Were they there at the formation of Azeroth as a whole? Hopefully all of these questions we'll get to in further episodes and be able to find answers once and for all. Um, more so once Shadowlands launches later this year. Ha ha ha. Or whenever it comes out. Who knows? And if you're wondering why there's a Zandalari scroll on the Mogu Island that's also the seat of power for former god emperor dictator and uh, person who enslaved the entire Pandaren race for 10,000 years, Lei Shen, well... That's another story for another time. Thank you for joining me on this first excursion through the essence of Azeroth. Have thoughts, questions, or want to see something specific in a future episode? Either leave me a voice note on our anchor.fm page at anchor.fm forward slash Azeroth podcast or send me a message on Twitter at the official EOA Twitter page, found at www.twitter.com forward slash Azeroth podcast. Did I miss something or mess something up? I probably did. Let me know. We're not above corrections here. Next time, join me as we continue to think about the afterlife and talk about the Death Knight class, its origins, place in the lore, and how Blizzard really needs to let me tank as Frost back once more, because Death Knight is my favorite class. <laughs> and as always, remember to set your hearthstone to home. Narration by Ashley Parrish. Written and recorded by Will Harrison. Credit to Blizzard Activision for voice lines and music from World of Warcraft included under fair use. I'm <laughs> gonna